Not all of the mighty or wise or noble of the earth could do anything. Not any of the founders of the religions of the world. Only Christ could say, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And you that trust in me shall live also. And he proved it by rising from the dead on Easter morning. From Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is the Coral Ridge Hour. looking for solid evidence for the Christian faith? But how do we know that the Bible is indeed God's Word? Those who would be effective witnesses for Christ need to realize that the resurrection is the unassailable fortress of Christianity. Dr. D. James Kennedy explains 12 reasons why I believe in this new book compiled by Dr. Jerry Newcomb to bolster your faith and help you answer tough questions. Dr. Kennedy boldly and clearly illustrates how you can know for sure that there is a God, the world was created, Jesus was born of a virgin, and the foundations of your faith are true. Contact us today to receive your copy of 12 Reasons Why I Believe, so that you can be equipped to answer the challenges of skeptics and share the evidence for your Christian faith. 
Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ not only rose from the dead, but had the power of life inherent within him. As he raised three other individuals from death, as we read today in the case of his friend Lazarus, whose sisters Martha and Mary are disconsolate because Christ was not there when their brother died. May we hear the word of God as it's found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. We shall begin our reading with the 20th verse. May we hear the word of our Father. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And may God speak to our hearts and minds through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. In his divine sovereignty and providence, God used to open the blind eyes of this once young man, a notable preacher by the name of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Now, Dr. Barnhouse was a formidable man. He was a large man and robust with a voice that could not be ignored. It was imperious, to say the least. I can still hear the tones ringing in my mind. And those of you that may have heard him in years gone by will remember that voice. It could not be ignored. Young man, he said, if you had had the audacity to say such a thing to the all-holy God that knows your every thought and deed, he would have instantly plunged you into the lake of fire. He had my attention. And soon Christ had my soul and my life was transformed. However, every encounter with Barnhouse did not quite end that way. Once, he came across an older man who was also a redoubtable antagonist to Christianity. It was indeed an irresistible force meeting an unmovable object. And Barnhouse told him the glories of the gospel of Christ, to which this older man responded, Poppycock. That, of course, is Greek. <laughs> Come tonight, I'll give you the interpretation. He said, I don't believe in your Bible or your Christ, and furthermore, I'm not afraid to die. You see, I've got my lodge, and that's every bit enough religion for me. It was a stalemate. They each went their separate ways. The months and years passed by, and several years later, Barnhouse learned that this man was now on the very edge of the valley of the shadow. He was in the hospital. He was not expected to come out. And so he made his way to the hospital, discovered what room he was in, and slipped in unobtrusively and sat in a corner seat, folded his hands in his lap, and said nothing. Now, the older man was totally unaware of 
Barnhouse's presence in the room, but he was keenly aware of another presence in that room, for this man was wrestling with the king of terrors. And he could be heard to moan and groan, saying, oh, oh no, no, oh no, no. And then he began to turn his head back and forth from one side to the other on his pillow. And then he opened his eyes and he espied Barnhouse seated in the corner. And he was appalled by the sight. And he said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, nothing. You told me that you were an atheist and you were not afraid to die, so I just thought I'd like to come and watch. But I won't do anything. So you just go ahead with whatever it is you're doing, and I'll just sit here and watch. And the man had the look of a wounded animal on his face, and with a voice of desperation, he said, you wouldn't mock a dying man, would you? And then he asked Barnhouse to tell him once again about Jesus. And Barnhouse had the opportunity once more to share the glad tidings of the Savior that came that we might be forgiven and have eternal life. And before the hour was up, the Son of Righteousness had risen in the Valley of the Shadow. And that old man entered into life. Well, I'm afraid that he is typical of a great many in our time today, many who don't have the faintest idea what's going to happen to them. They might put on a great deal of bravado while they are young and while health fills their bodies, but that's only because they've never stared into the hollow eyes of death and never really considered their own mortality. The great Dr. Samuel Johnson, who gave us the first magnificent dictionary of the English language, who was the center of social life in London, said that most of us run from one vocation or avocation to another throughout all of our lives, all in a vain effort to never think about our mortality. Yes, there are many who may pretend that they have no fear of death, but unless they have come to know the conqueror of death, they are merely pretending and deceiving. Epicurus, 2,000 years ago, who was not a Christian, said very well, what men fear is not that death is annihilation, but what they fear is that it is not. T.S. Eliot, more recently, in Murder in the Cathedral, declared, not what we call death, but what beyond death is not death. We fear, we fear. How true that is. And it has been echoed by numerous people, great and mighty as well as others. I mentioned Johnson, he wrote to Dr. Taylor in the latter part of his own life, and he said, oh my friend, the approach of death is very dreadful. I am afraid to think on that which I know I cannot avoid. It is vain to look round and round for that help which cannot be had. There is a brilliant conversationalist, author, writer, intellectual, who stands terrified before, indeed, the king of terrors. Thomas Carlyle, the great author, when he was describing the phantasmagorical scene that surrounded the funeral of Louis the Magnificent, including the great organ music that seemed to be some plaintive prayer of hopelessness, said this, frightful to all men is death from of old named the king of terrors. But I think Sir Walter Raleigh may have described it best as he apostrophized death, saying, O oh, thou eloquent, just, and mighty death, whom none could
could advise, thou hast persuaded, whom none has, what none has dared, thou hast done, whom all the world flattered, thou hast despised and cast out of the world, and thou hast gathered together all of the far-flung greatness, all of the vanity, all of the pride and riches and accomplishment, and thou hast covered them all over with two narrow words, hic jacent, here lies. Yes, who is capable of dealing with such an adversary as this mighty death who says to the ill, come. He says to the well, tarry not. He is indeed an implacable foe, a mighty enemy. He is the last enemy who is to be overcome, death, and all that lies in the realm of death. Who is the man who had the highest IQ of all that ever lived on this planet? We could probably take a lot of guesses and you may not come up with it, but according to the scientists that study such things and realizing the connection that exists between vocabulary and IQ have concluded that it was William Shakespeare. And Shakespeare said, or who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. And thus, conscience doth make cowards of us all. It is interesting to me to hear, as I have over my life, the skeptics wax voluble and eloquent about their unbelief. But it is also more interesting to see them when they come to the end of their life, when the fogs of death begin to fill their throat. Think of Thomas Paine, who was a hero once in America until he published his Age of Reason, which was a book he gave a copy of to Ben Franklin, who urged him not to publish it, but he went ahead and in his pride he did so anyway, and it brought indeed all manner of ignominy upon him until he was forced to leave the country. When he came to the end of his life, however, he was not so robust, and he was not so skeptical. He said that he would give worlds if he had them, if the Age of Reason had not been published. Or take the most brilliant, caustic skeptic that probably ever lived, a man who wrote an entire encyclopedia against Christianity and the Bible. Do you know who that was? That was, of course, Voltaire, the great leader of the skeptical movement in France. But time moves on. And so at length, Voltaire came to the edge of the Valley of the Shadow. And as he was on his final bed, he found that his unbelief was failing him. Like the young man who had been led into unbelief by an older skeptic, and when the young man was taken sick and was going to die, the skeptic was afraid he would recant, and came to him and said, now young man, he said, hold on, hold on. And the boy said, sir, you left me nothing to hold on to. And so it was with Voltaire, and he decided that what he wanted to do would be, be reconciled to the church. And so he called for a clergyman. And this 
got out and was rumored around Paris and caused a great stir among the skeptical community. And so the unbelievers rush to his house and to his bed to prevent this most embarrassing possible recantation. But when they got there, they found they had discovered their own ignominy and that of Voltaire as well. He said, be gone, ye wretches. And like Adam before him, he cast the blame on them. Look what you have brought me to. Get out of my sight, and he threw them out of his house. His physician said he was the most wretched looking human being that he'd ever seen. He called for a secretary and had a statement of his recantation written and signed by two witnesses, and it availed him not at all. Remember, dear friend, God says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. God cannot always be found. And there are times when our heart can become so encrusted with sin, so adamant in rebellion that we cannot bring ourselves to repent or even to believe. And though Voltaire had this signed and witnessed statement of his recantation and of his faith, it meant nothing at all, for there was no heart in it. And he lived for two more months. So came his physician said it was an unbelievably miserable thing. Even his unbelieving friends would no longer come into the house because his cries and his anguish were so incredibly horrible. At length, he would vacillate between saying, Oh Christ, oh Christ Jesus, help me, till coming and saying, I am abandoned by God and men. He'd say, do not leave me. Send somebody to be with me. It is hell to be alone, to die alone. Yes, my friends, I think of all of the thousands of people that read his works and were turned from the faith. Only I wish that they could have tiptoed into that death chamber and seen the greatest of all of the skeptics when he came to look into the face, the hollowed eyes and lank-jawed skull of death itself, the king of terrors. How is it with you? Is death something that you fear and dread? Or have you been delivered from death? The Bible tells us that Satan has kept the whole world in bondage throughout all of their lives through the fear of death. Is that fear in your heart? Can you actually think of death without terror? Can you think of it as a glorious graduation and coronation day? Is it something that you can look forward to with anticipation or is it a forbidding and foreboding evil? that you cringe at the very thought of and will not let yourself think about it. It is a formidable foe, and down through the centuries it has marched and no one has impeded or slowed its advance. Think of the graves that it has left. Where is the city without a cemetery? Where is the field without a grave? Where is the home that has not been hung in crepe? Indeed, O oh earth, how multitudinous are the citizens of the sod. O oh sea, how vast is the population that dwells in thy caverns. O oh mighty death, who can deal with this implacable foe. There is only one, and that is Christ. Not all of the mighty or wise or noble of the earth could do anything. 
not any of the founders of the religions of the world, only Christ could say, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and you that trust in me shall live also. And he proved it by rising from the dead on Easter morning. How glorious that is. Has he accomplished that victory in your heart? Have you received him as Savior and Lord? Why is it that conscience makes cowards of us all? It is because every one of us is conscious of the fact that he or she has sinned in the eyes of an all-holy God who is of purer eyes than even to look upon iniquity and who has sworn that he will punish our transgressions with a rod. And therefore we feel guilty. And we face death and we know not what lies beyond that dark shadow. But Christ, by his cross, took away our guilt and sin, and by his resurrection, took away that black question mark and opened the glories of paradise to all of those that will trust in him. You know there's no other religion that has a hymn like Blessed Assurance, because no other religion has Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Have you, can you sing that from your heart in truth? Do you have that blessed assurance or do you have that fearful dread of what lies beyond the curtain of death? Christ wants you to have that joy. He wants you to have that certainty. He wants to dispel the fear over and over again, he said, fear not, fear not, be not afraid, it is I. But it means nothing at all unless we receive that victory as our own, unless we invite him to come and set up that cross in our own hearts, to be our Savior, our Lord, our God, our King, the conqueror of the grave. Is he that to you? Is your life lived to his glory? Do you live the purpose that he has given to you to glorify his name, to advance his kingdom, to make him known to a lost world? Is that what you do the rest of the year? If so, you can have that assurance. You can know that when you leave this world, you are going to a realm that death cannot enter. You are entering a city that has no cemetery, a city decked with silver and lilies, a city where we will live forever with Christ, a city where there are transparent mansions of gold, a city through whose windows that light-jawed skull cannot grin, in capacious chambers where that bony finger cannot beckon, a city where in new and deathless bodies which shall throb with the thrill of endless life, we shall adore his matchless name. Ah, my friend, that is what I desire for every one of you that certainty, that assurance, that joy that only Christ can give, that you will know that you will soon be in that place where you will be rejoined to those that you have loved and lost, where you will receive all that has been taken from you in this life, where you will indeed be crowned the crest of triumph and you will look upon him who is the conqueror of death and the Lord of glory. And you will stand full in the undimmed blaze of Emmanuel's smile. You will have reached paradise, and you will know that there in that glorious place where the fountains are filled with the water of life eternal, that you will look upon him at his glorious conqueror's throne, and you will sing, Alleluia, Hosanna, our Savior 
hath conquered the tomb. Our Savior hath conquered death. Our Savior has brought us all the way to glory. May we pray. Blessed Redeemer, only Savior, Thou who alone hath died for the sins of the world, Thou who alone hath risen from the grave and brought life and immortality to light, Thou who alone who desires to give that gift to all that will come to Thee, I pray that by Thy mighty and sovereign Holy Spirit that Thou wilt right now draw unto Thyself some whom thou hast chosen to receive eternal life, that they may say, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to thee. I believe that it was for me that thou hast anguished and agonized upon the cross, that it was for my sins that thou hast died. I accept you as my Lord and Savior and Master, I repent of my sins and henceforth desire to follow thee until that day when clothed in immortality I shall see thee face to face. In thy holy name I pray, amen.
How glorious is that anthem! How beautiful the music! And if it sounds that wonderful here, what will it sound like in that great resurrection morning when we gather together from every nation, tongue, and tribe upon the face of this earth to sing the praises of our God? How magnificent that will be! But dear friend, I would ask you on this Easter morning, will you be there in that great resurrection morning as we gather together to sing the praises of Christ who by then has brought us all the way to glory? Do you know that Christ has risen in your heart? Do you have the blessed assurance of knowing for certain that you're going to go to heaven? If not, dear friend, on this Easter day, make sure once and for all, would you like to receive Him into your life? He died that we might live. He lives that we may never die. Won't you invite Him into your heart right now? Pray with me this prayer, won't you? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of sinners, divine giver of life eternal, come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. For I acknowledge, O Christ, that I have sinned against Thee every day of my life. In thought and word and deed, in omission and commission, I've grieved Thee by ten thousand falls, most of which I don't even remember. But You know them all, and yet, amazing to tell, You love me in spite of them. And I thank You for that love, and I thank You for Your death upon the cross for me. I accept You into my heart as Savior and Lord of my life. I gladly receive the gift of eternal life. I repent of my sins. Help me to turn from it and to follow Thee. In Thy blessed name I pray." Dear friend, I hope that that was the prayer of your heart. If so, the promise of Christ is, He that trusts in Me already has eternal life. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, the senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, founded by Dr. D. James Kennedy. I hope you prayed that prayer with Dr. Kennedy. And if you did, we would like to help you get started in your new faith by sending you Beginning Again, written by Dr. Kennedy. You'll learn how to read and study the Bible, which is essential to every Christian's life. You'll learn how to pray, and very importantly, you'll discover how to share with others what Christ has done for you. To receive your copy of Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number and make sure you ask for Beginning Again. May God richly bless you. The Apostle Paul himself said that if Jesus Christ were not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. What a statement. Dear friend, that's exactly how important the resurrection is. But is there historical evidence to support the resurrection? Can that evidence stand up in a modern day court of trial? Let's find out. 2,000 years ago, something extraordinary took place on a sleepy Sunday morning during springtime in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ rose from the dead or so Christians have asserted from the beginning, including eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. But is it an historical fact? The bottom line for Christianity is this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he did so in confirmation of his radical claims. Mike Lacona, seen here talking to a youth group, is a speaker in the field of Christian apologetics and is the author of the book, Cross-Examined. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he's a fraud, a false prophet, whom no rational person should follow. But when you look at the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection, I think that we can prove that Jesus rose from the dead because it is a well-attested historical fact. Recently, Mike provided the main research on behalf of the American Center for Law and Justice for a significant debate. On April 6, 2001, in the U.S. Senate chambers, a panel of three judges heard a mock trial on the question of whether or not Christ rose from the dead. We're here this morning to hear oral argument on the case of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was crucified. 
On the third day, the tomb was empty. There is no corpse here. We're talking about a resurrected body, a glorified body. Do not all your accounts have to be viewed in the, with some skepticism uh, uh, faced against the uh, empirical uh, scientific uh, proof, since I don't think you have such proof, do you? Certainly coming after the crucifixion, the apostles may have misperceived Jesus that they presumed to see. They may simply have been in good faith seeing something that wasn't there. That under, under would have, could have, uh, you don't have any proof that they did misspeak, they did misperceive, or that they didn't understand what they saw. Or they may have been speaking of something figuratively. Reading the tenor of the Bible, this, this is specific people talking about a specific person. It doesn't have the look of a metaphorical writing of any of the ancient writings. Reverend Paul Schenk and his brother Rob, both with a national clergy council which they founded, sponsored this unique event. Well, this was a historic moment in the United States Senate. Never before, at any time, has the Senate considered the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The three-judge panel that heard the case included Justice William Ostrowski, now retired from the New York Supreme Court. I thought it was uh, fantastic. I spent a lot of time preparing for it. Also on the panel was Lauren Smith, formerly Chief Judge of the United States Court of Federal Claims. My own faith is, is I'm Jewish, and yet it seems to me that whatever your faith is, uh, a uh, honest person, and I believe in God, must look at what the evidence is, not what you want the evidence to be, but what the evidence is. For the next few minutes, we want to explore some of that evidence, as heard in the mock trial or as heard from its chief researcher. We want to focus on a few questions related to the resurrection of Christ. The first is this, were the disciples lying when they claimed to see the resurrected Christ? People of other faiths and causes, even communists who don't even believe in God, um, are willing to die for their cause and for their religious beliefs. And this does not establish that the disciples were telling the truth, but the fact that they were willing to suffer and die for their beliefs indicates that they sincerely thought these beliefs to be true. In other words, you can't accuse the disciples of lying. You could say they hallucinated the risen Jesus uh, or that Jesus never died, but you can't say that they were lying because liars make poor martyrs. Even Bruce Fine, the constitutional attorney who argued for the skeptics in this mock trial, acknowledges that the disciples did not make up the resurrection incident out of whole cloth. I have no doubt, after all, something I don't think there's really much dispute uh, uh, at all that there was uh, a crucifixion. And obviously persons were traumatized, and the, uh, the Christian sect at that time was very small and oppressed. Uh, so there's no doubt that something happened and may be reported figuratively or otherwise. So even most skeptics believe that the disciples truly believed that they had seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Many have speculated that the disciples, in their extreme grief after the execution of Jesus, imagined his appearances to them. So is it possible that the disciples were hallucinating? We know from psychology that hallucinations are not group occurrences. And yet the disciples, on many occasions, we know that they were claiming that as a group, they experienced the risen Jesus. Uh, he ate with them, he walked with them, he dialogued with them, they recorded his words, and we have independent accounts of that. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul is the last person who would have imagined a risen Christ. At the time of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was a confirmed Christian hater who would do anything to destroy the church. Paul's conversion is very significant in the eyes of scholars today. And the reason is, is because here we have someone that someone can't say, well, you've got these disciples who were biased, they loved Jesus, uh, and so therefore they wanted him risen from the dead. Paul is a skeptic. Paul is more than a skeptic, he's an enemy of Christianity. Next, there is what Mike Lacona calls the Jerusalem factor. The disciples, if they're going around and they're making up this story that the whole thing is a fraud, they might be able to get away with it by going up to Greece or Asia Minor or present day Turkey. However, we find that the disciples were proclaiming the risen Jesus in the very city in which Jesus was publicly executed and buried, which if the body were still in the tomb, then if you're a critic, we would expect you to go to the tomb, exhume the body, 
put it on a cart, wheel it through Main Street, Jerusalem, and the hoax is over. Finally, the question came up in this mock trial as to whether or not the resurrection of Jesus Christ is nonsense in the scientific age. But does science disprove the resurrection? That would be your be proof, proof, wouldn't it? That, that, that just simply that dead people don't come alive. Exactly, and that, that, that again does not mean that in fact they can't come alive. Science may be wrong. The evidence is not scientific or not scientific, it's people who are coming in and saying, I saw Jesus. Uh, presumably that's not a theory, either they saw Jesus or they didn't see Jesus. Science is not evidence itself, it presents theories which change. Well, stones falling from the sky in the 19th century were completely rejected by science and they must be some other explanation. And yet we now know there are meteorites and stones fall from the sky almost every day. History is a science, and in fact, some of your four most prominent atheists of the last century, the 20th century, acknowledge history as such. The science is usually based on repeated observation, and of course, the resurrection itself was a one-time event, so it's, it's a different kind of science. Everybody looked at Jesus, saw him beaten to death, and hung and died, and carried to a tomb and buried, and then, a couple days later, saw him walking around. That's scientific. When you see a person that you saw dead, you now see them alive and walking around. That's science. And so, despite 2,000 years of various theories to explain away the risen Jesus, many believe that the best evidence points to his historical resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is a profound event in history. And when we look at the evidence, we see that Jesus' resurrection is the only plausible explanation to account for the data. Are you looking for solid evidence for the Christian faith? But how do we know that the Bible is indeed God's Word? Those who would be effective witnesses for Christ need to realize that the resurrection is the unassailable fortress of Christianity. Dr. D. James Kennedy explains 12 reasons why I believe in this new book compiled by Dr. Jerry Newcomb to bolster your faith and help you answer tough questions. Dr. Kennedy boldly and clearly illustrates how you can know for sure that there is a God. The world was created. Jesus was born of a virgin and the foundations of your faith are true. Contact us today to receive your copy of 12 Reasons Why I Believe so that you can be equipped to answer the challenges of skeptics and share the evidence for your Christian faith. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.